So what is this public key encryption? Uh, let me tell you about it. Again, it's like symmetric key encryption. You have a generator a function, an encryption and a decryption function, and a security parameter n. And you again have Alice and Bob, but now it's a more complicated story. Uh, there's another question I'll get to in a second. There's another complicated uh, wrinkle to the story, which is public key encryption goes like this, and it's exactly like RSA if you know RSA. So Bob, when he wants to you know, start participating, he runs the generation scheme and tells the generation function you know, the security parameter n, which might be 1,000 or something, and he gets two keys. One is called the secret key, and one is called the public key, pk and sk. And you know, the public key he publishes you know, on his home page, some like, you know, thousand bit string or something, and he keeps the secret key key secret. And now Alice, if she wants to uh, send a secret message to Bob, she uses an encryption function that takes as input the message and also Bob's public key, and that produces the ciphertext. And Bob has the ability to decrypt her message, here, her ciphertext C, using his secret key. Okay, so this is kind of um, cooler because it does not involve Alice and Bob like having the ability to get together in advance and secretly agree on a secret key that they privately store forever. Now you just need everybody to privately do their own thing and hold their secret key secret, but they don't have to do this collaboratively. Okay, let me get back to a question that was asked. The question is, how does quantum fit into these worlds? Uh, good question. I mean, it's, uh, it's fine in the sense that, um, yeah, this is a good question, let me bring it up. So uh, what these world means depend, oops, on what is your definition of efficient computation? Like P equals NP is like, you know, it really means NP can be solved efficiently. So, you know, it probably says whether you take that to mean NP equals P or NP equals BPP, you know, whatever. I'll just call them the same thing. That world was called algorithmica. And so now you could say like, well, um, perhaps I want to make my definition of efficient computation quantum efficient computation. And in that world, when you make that decision, then you might become less convinced that we're living in the world of cryptomania. Because, for example, RSA security relies on the fact that it's hard to factor, basically, that relies on the fact that it's hard to efficiently factorize integers. Uh, but we know quantum computers can efficiently factorize integers with a Shor's algorithm. And so that might lead you to believe, if you accept quantum computation, to think, oh, maybe we're not living in cryptomania. Unless we come up with some different way to achieve public key encryption that does not rely on hardness of factoring. And this is a very popular uh, area of study, post-quantum cryptography. And as I mentioned later, we in fact do have candidates for public key encryption that are not broken by any known crypt, uh, quantum algorithms. So maybe we still believe that we live in cryptomania, despite the fact that RSA is broken with quantum computers. Okay, so this was public key encryption. And uh, there's a notion for public key encryption of one-bit message security, which is exactly like one message security, but it's even weaker. Uh, it only refers to messages that are one bit long. And it says, uh, basically, when you do this scheme and you, you know, have the public key and the secret key, um, whether Alice is planning on uh, encrypting the message, the single bit message zero or the single bit message one, anybody that sees the public key of Bob together with the encryption of zero, they cannot tell the difference if they're PPT from the public key of Bob together with the encryption of one. So that's the definition of security. It's like inability to tell the difference between an encryption of zero and an encryption of one, even knowing the public key, as Eve certainly does. And a theorem, which is actually not that hard, is if you're given a one-bit secure public key encryption scheme, you can construct from it, you know, a public key encryption scheme with this like much better, you know, multiple message, shows in plain text attack security property. So it's actually known, this is a theorem that like if you want to get like awesome public key encryption, you just have to, well, quote unquote, just have to get like one bit secure public key encryption, which is like good, you know, it gives you something easier to aim for. So one might ask, okay, uh, I, well, I sort of told you that even assuming that like cryptographic PRGs exist, which we know is a consequence of one-way functions existing, we don't know how to get public key encryption. The best thing we know is we know that like if trapdoor one-way permutations exist, 
uh, then you can construct public key encryption from them. And I won't define trapdoor one-way permutation, but it's like one-way permutation is like a one-way function, which is also a permutation. It maps, you know, n-bit strings to n-bit strings in a bijective way. This is really basically not much of a big difference between that and one-way functions. It's practically the same thing. But trapdoor, you know, means as this like extra gadget property where like, Mm, it's easy to compute, hard to invert, but there's a way to generate like a trapdoor secret that makes it easy to invert if you know the trapdoor. And long story short, cryptographers are not super happy with this assumption because like we don't know great candidates or we don't really know great candidates that are not just like direct public key encryption schemes. So like you can get public key encryption by RSA and then uh, to assume that it's secure, you basically assume that RSA is secure. I mean, it's related to the security of factoring, but it's not actually the same thing. Or for, you can also get it from this like uh, computational Diffie-Hellman assumptions, just some other assumption that's like number theoretical, but basically it's sort of designed to give you public key encryption. So somehow people are not that satisfied with this state of affairs uh, here. I mean, in practice, RSA seems believable and it gives us public key encryption, but sort of only gives us that and it is broken by quantum. But I would like to now tell you, uh, well, another deficiency, uh, let me mention another, not deficiency, but a fact. These are all assumptions about certain hard problems being hard on average. So it's not just that um, they're hard in the worst case, but even you know, when you choose a random input, all but a negligible fraction of the inputs are hard. You know, it's like, it's hard to factor to the product of two random primes, for example. That's like an assumption related to RSA's uh, assumption. But now I want to tell you about a cool development from 15 years ago uh, due to Oded Regev, uh, which was recently awarded the Girdle Prize. And it led to great developments in cryptography theory. And uh, his paper from 2005 did two things. One, it introduced a new assumption called, and I'll explain this, the LWE assumption. LWE stands for learning with errors, but it's some assumption. So it's an assumption that a certain problem is hard. Okay, it has something to do with, um, well, I'll explain it in a moment. But one thing he showed is that uh, if, you if you make this assumption, then you can get public key encryption. People are like, okay, fine. I mean, we've seen that before. You make the assumption that some problem is hard and you get public key encryption, great. Uh, and, you know, this problem did seem to be hard, but why is this better than other, why is this better than just using RSA? Well, one thing, which is what excited people the most was he also showed another theorem that this assumption, LWE, which is also the form, you know, a certain problem is hard for random inputs. He proved it, assuming some other problem is hard in the worst case. And that was really exciting to people. It's the first time they'd seen like this worst case to hardness, uh, uh, average case reduction. So there's some problem about lattices. This is a geometric object. I'm not gonna talk about it more, but like lattices are like, you know, regular arrangements of points in space. You know, like the cubic lattice or triangular lattice, honeycomb lattice, but extended to high dimensions. And there's like tasks associated to it, like find the shortest vector in a given lattice and so forth. And some problem, which had been studied before, certainly by, um, algorithm assist. In fact, it had been studied by um, Lovas in the context of trying to come up with polynomial time uh, implementations of the ellipsoid algorithm. We talked about this at the very end of the LP lecture about how you need some like number theory results about like um, multi-dimensional greatest com common divisor algorithms. Uh, that actually is related to geometric lattices and these people had studied these lattice problems. Anyway, he showed this cool result, which is if you assume this problem is merely worst case hard, like there's no, you know, efficient algorithm that solves this problem in the worst case, then he deduced the average case hardness of this LWE problem, that it's hard even for random inputs, and from that constructed public key encryption. So these two things together were pretty great. And it made people like a lot happier about, I don't know, the theoretical foundations for let's say public key encryption. And this is indeed a hard problem, seemingly, de facto. Uh, the best known algorithm for it runs basically in exponential time, two to the n over log n. People have thought about it, so it's not like we just haven't known anything about this weird problem. 
What also is intriguing, though, is it's, there's also good evidence that it's not an NP-hard problem, which is very intriguing. It's like one of these intermediate problems where it doesn't seem to be in polynomial time, but also doesn't seem to be NP-hard, which is intriguing that it, this worst case to average case result did not hold for an NP-hard problem. <clears throat> Another kind of amazing thing, it's almost like a weird coincidence when I tell it to you. I put a little asterisk here. Uh, this result that LWE is true, assuming this gap SVP problem, this lattice problem is hard for efficient algorithms. He needed to assume that it's hard, not just for efficient classical algorithms, but efficient quantum algorithms. So if you believe that the best quantum algorithm for this gap SVP problem for solving in the worst case, you know, still takes exponential time and LWE holds and you get public key encryption. It's kind of amazing. Uh, that also sort of blew people's minds. I should say that a subsequent paper of Pikert sort of relax this uh, to get like a variation on the parameters, which is not as good a variation on the parameters, but assuming it, you only need to assume that like classical logarithms cannot solve some uh, lattice problem. Okay, so in the last few slides, I wanna tell you just a little bit about this LWE assumption, because it's pretty cool and worth knowing about. So here it is all on this one slide. So there's a lot of parameters and like there's one security parameter n and there's all like two or three other parameters like q and alpha and you can choose these parameters according to your taste and that makes the assumption different in slightly way, different ways. Um, I'm just going to tell you like one reasonable way to fix all the parameters in parentheses and don't get too hung up on the parameters. Just try to get the gist of the problem. So given n, uh, the LWE learning with error problems involves fixing a, a Q, which is going to be like you're going to be working with numbers mod Q, and you, Q should be polynomial in N, ideally, and it's typically a prime that's around N squared. Alpha is some parameter, uh, we'll see, um, which is like 1 over poly N, typically like something a little bit like 1 over root N. And chi is an error distribution. And it's an error distribution, it's a probability distribution on numbers mod Q. And it's like uh, a Gaussian distribution on numbers mod Q, which is a little bit weird because you think of Gaussians as distributions on real numbers. Uh, but you know, this axis here is like the numbers mod Q and chi is sort of like a discretized Gaussian. So formally to get chi, you draw a regular old Gaussian, a real number Gaussian with mean zero and standard deviation alpha Q. So remember alpha is like a small fraction you know, the numbers mod Q range between, you know, zero and Q or minus Q over two and Q over two. And you choose a random real Gaussian, you know, with standard deviation, a small fraction of Q. And then you just round it off to an integer and that's chi. This means round it off to an integer. And now uh, having fixed all these parameters, there's some kind of like algorithmic game or some algorithmic task. And how does it go? You know, somebody chooses a secret string, well, a secret vector s, which is like a list of n numbers mod q. It's chosen uniformly at random. And now the algorithm that's playing this game gets to ask for some uh, information about s. It gets to ask for these quote unquote noisy linear equations about s. So the algorithm gets to say like, I don't know what this secret vector s is, but please give me one noisy linear equation about it. Okay, and when it asks, makes that request, uh, what happens is, Coefficients a1 through an are chosen uniformly integers mod q. And then the person that knows the secret, uh, you know, calculates a1 s1 plus a2 s2 plus dot 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 an sn. And that's some number, that's some number. But they don't just tell the, the algorithm who's playing the game, the sort of the secret holder doesn't just tell the algorithm the number b. They tell them the number, but with some error e. And this error is drawn from chi. So they compute the actual dot product of a with s, but then they add in this extra error to make it like a noisy linear equation. And then they tell back the algorithm, the coefficients a, and this noisy version of b. The algorithm's some like noisy linear equation. And the algorithm can say, hmm, interesting. And then it can request another equation, noisy linear equation, and another noisy linear equation. But the algorithm is polynomial time, so it can ask for at most polynomially many no equations like this. And of course, if there's no error, then it could just ask for like n equations, and then it would be solving a system of linear equations in n unknowns over a field. And so, great, it would just recover the secret. But Gaussian elimination or solving equations is very sensitive to noise, especially like in the world of like 
modulo a prime, as it turns out. And so it's not clear what to do if you're getting these like noisy right-hand sides. And finally, the LWE assumption is that like when you play this game, somebody holds onto the secret S and gives you back these noisy linear equations, no polynomial time, no PPT algorithm can you know, exactly figure out S with high probability. Okay, so that's the assumption. It's you know related to things like decoding random codes and learning uh, you know parodies with error. So uh, I'll answer a question in a second. Um, you know, it didn't come out of the blue, so people could have some reasonable intuition that it was hard and therefore a believable assumption. And then we have this other uh, theorem that Regev proved that showed that this problem is this assumption is true, assuming the worst case hardness of some lattice problem. The question is, are the AIs are drawn only once? No, they're drawn every time like the algorithm, so you have like an algorithm of PP, a poor PPT algorithm interacting with like some person that knows a secret. And the algorithm can always say like, please give me a linear equation about your secret S. And at that time, the A's are, some A's are drawn randomly and an error is drawn randomly. And the algorithm learns the A's together with the true value of like A dot S, but plus this error. Okay, and so when the algorithm asks for another equation, fresh A's are drawn and a fresh error is drawn. And uh, every time it asks for an equation, it gets a fresh A and fresh errors. Okay. Uh, so that's learning with errors. And what I can now tell you is, I can actually literally tell you how Regev built a one-bit public key encryption scheme uh, which is secure, assuming the LWE assumption. So I won't prove that it's secure, assuming LWE, uh, but I'll tell you what the scheme is at least. And then also remember, I also told you if you have a one-bit encryption scheme, you can. It's known already how to bootstrap it into like a multi-round, indistinguishable against chosen plain text attack scheme. So here's the scheme. Think of it as like you know an alternative to RSA. Uh, it allows you to send one-bit messages. So uh, when you're generating your public and secret key, you know with security parameter n, uh, the secret key is like one of these s's. Okay, it's a random uh, vector of length n mod q. Remember, q is like n squared or something. So it's like n, I don't know, two log, two n log n bits. Uh, and the public key that you generate is you yourself generate m like noisy, uh, m noisy linear equations about s of this type. And m should again be set to something like a little bit bigger than n, like n log n. Uh, so you you pick, you know, m different vectors a, and you know s, so you compute like a i dot s, uh, but you don't publish the exact answer b i. You publish b plus an error, uh, and that's it. So you give away this like information, like m noisy linear equations about your secret key s. You make that public. But like the LWE assumption intuitively tells you, well, even given this, nobody's going to be able to guess your secret key except with non-negligible probability. So that's good. But you know, the task is not about guessing a secret key. The task is about encryption and uh, you know, guessing messages. So what's the encryption scheme? Now let's say Alice comes along and she wants to send a message to Bob. So she looks at Bob's public key, which is like these A's and these you know, error-filled B's. And she wants to encrypt the bit zero. What does she do? She chooses a random subset of the a's, the a vectors. You know, so we have like, maybe this is s, it's like unknown to Alice. We have all these rows, these are the a's, we have n of them, and those are, rows are published, and you know, they're associated to uh, some answers. These are the b's that have noise. And she just adds up, uh, the A vectors and also the B answers for this random subset she chose. And she, this is the subset, the ciphertext, the sum of the A's and the sum of the B's, all mod Q. <clears throat> and uh, when she wants to encrypt one, she does basically the same thing, except she takes the final sum, B sum, and she adds Q over two mod Q, which is basically like the maximal noise. She almost like sort of negates it. And the idea for why this is secure is like, you know, an adversary is like so bad at like understanding what S is, just knowing these A's and B's, 
that this is kind of like sort of like a new equation, a new noisy fact that like a sum dot s is basically the same as b sum. It's like a new noisy equation that like Alice could generate herself, but adversaries are so bad at understanding them that they can't tell if you generated it like kind of correctly or you put in like maximal noise on the answer. But Bob, who knows the secret key, who knows s, can with high probability decrypt. So what Bob does is he takes the secret s, which he knows, uh, sorry, this should say, uh, well, I can say b here. Uh, it's either b sum or it's b sum plus q over two, this b. And he just computes this and he's like, if it came out really close to zero, then he's like, she was trying to encrypt zero. And if it came out pretty close to q over two, then he said she was trying to encrypt q over two. And you know, whichever it's closest to, he'll, uh, you know, guess based on. And it won't be exactly equal to them, right? Because like the thing he published had some noise in the right-hand sides. So the only thing I'll say is why this algorithm is correct in the sense that Bob can decode. And if, you know, the correctness follows from the fact that like, um, suppose that he didn't put any errors into the public key, which is a bad idea because then people can actually learn S. But if he didn't put any errors in, then the decryption scheme would be always 100% correct. You would either always get zero or always get exactly Q over two. Now, since there are errors, uh, the decryption will fail if the sum of the errors he put into his public key, uh, or at least the ones that got put into S, uh, into the encryption, have magnitude that's bigger than like Q over four. That's like an amount which will be enough to like screw up your ability to distinguish between zero and Q over two. But now you can just check like you have the sum of M errors. Each one is like a Gaussian basically. It's like a rounded off Gaussian with standard deviation root M times the standard deviation of a single error. The single error standard deviation was alpha Q and root M is comes from the fact that you're summing M errors. And now you just plug in the parameters, the suggested parameters. So M was suggested to be N log N, alpha was suggested to be like this. So, you know, basically it's chosen such that even with, you know, N log N equations, the total amount of uh, error is like a Gaussian with standard deviation is still a small fraction of Q, like one over poly log Q. And then the probability that like a Gaussian with standard deviation, like a small fraction of Q would get as large as Q over four is exponentially small in the square of the number of standard deviations. So it's like e to the minus theta of log cubed n, which is negligible. Okay, so uh, I'm out of time, but uh, if you wanna stick around for the last couple of slides, please do, otherwise it's fine. Uh, the proof of security is not actually that hard, assuming LWE, but I don't have time to show it, uh, but that's the scheme. And so really this is actually my last slide. Um, let me tell you, this is like a new approach to cryptography, basing it on LWE or these lattice based problems. It's quite different from all the previous stuff that maybe you've learned about before or that you heard of that was invented in like the sixties and seventies that are like based on number theory. And it's got some advantages. So one, the cool thing about, you know, Regev's theorem is that um, he showed his assumption is true based on the worst case assumption, a worst case hardness assumption about some problem, which hadn't really been seen before. Another thing that's cool is that over the last uh, 15 years, people have found cool cryptographic primitives that they wanted that they do know how to get based on like LWE assumptions that they do not know how to get by other assumptions like RSA or like hardness of factoring. So for example, a famous one that came out, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago called fully homomorphic encryption. It's like a cool cryptographic primitive generated a lot of excitement. Um, people know how to construct it, assuming the LWE assumption, <clears throat> and they don't know how to construct it if you just like, let's say, assume, you know, factoring random integers is hard. Finally, uh, it's also not broken by quantum computing. So if you believe that quantum computing is around the corner, then factoring integers is not hard. And so RSA is broken, but, People have thought about it a lot. You know, Peter Shore himself has attempted to, you know, crack these lattice problems using uh, quantum computing. It's, it's over the years, you know, 15 years, it's not been done. Uh, what about disadvantages? Uh, well, it was said, or at least for a while, that <clears throat> the number theory based constructions were like more efficient. Here, like, you know, you might have to worry about like, oh, if you want this amount of security, like how many bits does like the, 
secret keys and public keys need to be, how fast are the protocols for like encryption and decryption. And uh, for a while, you know, the number, you know, it was always polynomial this, polynomial that for LWE, but you know, in practice, you know, if you're gonna be running, you know, one of these schemes, like every time somebody types HTTPS in the browser, then you want them to be like hyper-efficient. And number theory ones were more efficient, uh, but they used to be. But there's been a lot of theoretical work over the years. And now the number theory ones, the lattice-based encryption, uh, lattice-based crypto algorithms are just as efficient as the number theory ones. And therefore, uh, there are no disadvantages, one might say, to lattice-based cryptography. So forget everything you know about RSA and um, just uh, go with lattice-based cryptography in all your future endeavors. Okay, so let me uh, end the recording there, but I shall stick around to answer your questions.